where the Irish kept pigs, the Italians kept goats. Another tradition carried over from the European countryside and transplanted to urban America. Italian goats were often kept in the apartments themselves and treated like family pets. <laughs> if, for instance, a homemaker was busy with her housework, she'd put the baby on the floor and have it play with the goat. <laughs> Ingenious little boys hitched their goats to soapbox wagons and raced around the tenement yards. The fun came to an end, however, on feast days like Easter, when the goat wound up on the family dinner table. Both of these animals, the goats and the pigs, were raised primarily for private consumption. The Jewish poultry farm, however, was a full-blown commercial enterprise. Most were located along Bayard and Baxter Streets, just a short stroll from 97 Orchard. And in all likelihood, Mrs. Gumberts, who lived in 97 Orchard from 1870 to 1884, um, would have done her shopping at these tenement poultry farms. Um, in all likelihood, she would have gone on a Thursday morning, Thursday afternoon or Friday morning in anticipation of the Sabbath to select her bird. Her technique was to blow between the tail feathers in order to reveal the color of the skin underneath, the yellow of the skin, the fat of the bird, and Jewish women wanted the fattest birds possible. With Mrs. Gumbert's watching, an itinerant rabbi slaughtered the bird, suspending it over a barrel filled with, with sawdust to collect the blood. Mrs. Gumbert's then carried her bird home, still warm, plucked it, gutted it, and salted it, and left it to drain on a slanted board. Two hours later, it was ready for the soup pot. Though east side farmers raised all kinds of fowl, their best seller was geese. Jewish immigrants ate their geese roasted and stewed. They smoked the breast meat or preserved it in fat along with the, the legs like a French confit. They fried the skin to make ribbonous or cracklings, while the feet, the wing, the heart, and the necks were used to make gansekwein, which was essentially a very um, savory and spicy fricassee. Jews relied on the farms for a steady source of kosher meat, but just as important, the birds, and yeast in particular, supplied immigrants with a kosher form of cooking fat, the food already mentioned that we know as schmaltz. The 19th century Jewish cook depended on schmaltz for frying, for braising, for roasting, and even for her baked goods. But schmaltz was more than useful. To the Jewish palate, the luscious, nutty taste of goose fat was the very essence of goodness. Schmaltz was a key ingredient in many of the most important holiday dishes, including cholent, um, tzimis, um, and the list goes on. Finally, geese furnished Jewish immigrants with a seasonal delicacy, the fattened livers, otherwise known as foie gras. We may think of foie gras as a luxury item, which it is, but fattened goose liver was also a traditional food of East European Jews. It's typically eaten around Hanukkah. Over the centuries, Jewish women had perfected a technique for fattening geese. This is the process that gives you foie gras, and that also increases schmaltz production, which they brought to the Lower East Side in the second half of the 19th century. Early Jewish American cookbooks give us a, pic a picture of how it was prepared. In one recipe, the liver was simply dredged in flour and fried in goose fat with cloves and onion. Jewish cooks also simmered their liver with onion and garlic, mashed it into a paste, and served it cold with calf's foot jelly and hard-boiled egg. So it was, it was a pate. Yeah, this is also the ancestor of chopped liver. For those who couldn't afford the real thing, there was imitation foie gras made from chicken livers, gizzards, schmaltz, and onion. You can find recipes for this uh, poor man's goose liver in early Jewish American cookbooks, and I've actually included one in 97 Orchard. 
Eventually, the health inspectors were successful in their, mis in their mission and managed to close down the goose farms. From a sanitary perspective, clearly this was a great leap forward. But the closing of the farms was also the beginning of the end of a great culinary tradition. With the farms gone, the goose and all its lovely byproducts began their slow fade from the Jewish dinner table. A second group of visitors to the Lower East Side were medical professionals. This group included dispensary doctors, visiting nurses, and most important to our story, dietitians who studied the immigrants' food habits. Early 20th century dietitians identified two basic pitfalls of the immigrants' diet. Number one was the immigrants' low levels of milk consumption. Number two was the abundance of rich and highly seasoned food in the immigrants' diet. As a group, and this sort of cut across um, ethnic and national boundaries, immigrants used too much garlic, too much onion, too much pepper, too much spices. They ate too many cured meats and were too generous with the condiments. But the one food that most unnerved American health workers was the pickle. <laughs> By the standards of that day, pickles were considered too salty, too garlicky, too peppery, and too sour. All in all, they were just too flavorful. <laughs> and though Jews were the chief pickle producers in the U.S., other immigrant groups discovered the pickle and developed a taste for it. According to the experts, children were the innocent victims of the immigrant pickle habit. <laughs> Health workers were appalled to learn that tenement school kids spent their lunch money on pickles <laughs> instead of more appropriate foods like milk and applesauce. <laughs> the taste of the standard Jewish pickle was so aggressive that Americans wondered how anyone, and children in particular, could eat them by choice. Instead, and this is not an exaggeration, they saw pickle eating as a kind of compulsion. The undernourished child was drawn to pickles the same way adults were drawn to alcohol. More than a food, the pickle was a kind of drug for tenement kids who were still too young for whiskey. As it turns out, the experts were not entirely wrong. Kids did have a special affection for pickles. For a single penny, pickles developed, delivered a wall of flavor. And if you knew how to eat one, a single pickle could last all day. Um, there's a wonderful section um, in a tree grows in Brooklyn um, that deals with pickle eating. Um, and it describes how the heroine of the story, who's not in fact Jewish, but half Irish and half German, would go to the Jewish pickle vendor in the morning buy her pickle and spend the rest of the day nursing it, sucking it, nibbling it. So, uh, you know, for the tenement kid, this was the popsicle that wouldn't melt. <laughs> Americans felt it was their duty to tear the immigrant away from their pickles and all of their other pungent foods and teach them the virtues of plain American cooking. It was for their own benefit, of course, but it was also for the good of the country. Americans believed that culinary reform was the key to assimilation of the foreign-born, a matter of very grave concern in the politically nervous years uh, just before, during, and after World War I. As a result, culinary instruction became a regular feature of the East Side settlement houses. These classes focused on adults. Classes for children, a more impressionable audience, became a regular part of the public school curriculum at around the same time. Not only in New York, but in cities across the US, immigrant girls learned how to boil oatmeal, how to poach eggs, and how to bake cornbread. The hope here was that educators could reach the parents by way of their children using their kids to smuggle American foods into the tenements. And to some measure, they were successful. 